Let me start with a short surah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kul abu zubi rabbin nas, malikin nas, ilahin nas, bin sharrin waswasil khan nas, allazi yuwaswisu fi surin nas, minal jinnati wal nas. Sadaqullahu nalim azim. Firstly, I need to thank a few people. I really want to thank uh, Muhammad Takir Amtullah, who allowed us to use his uh, Zoom platform. Um, our free, my free platform had the 40 minute limit. And uh, we started with that and we had to keep logging back in and it, it was quite uh, inconvenient. So Takir Amtula stepped forward, so we used his session. And then we came across another problem because uh, some of our programs became very popular. We exceeded the limit of 100 and many people could not join, which wasn't very nice, it happened twice. Um, so now we are grateful to Nudba Group who have kindly allowed us to use their platform. So, which has a much higher limit. So we'll work at it and then, you know, if we reach that limit, then we'll have to go to some other venue, maybe on YouTube or something or whatever. Anyway, so thank you all for stepping forward. Uh, I, I'm really blessed. Um, people come forward, people help, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's all for a good cause. So everything works well, thank you. Last but not least, my right hand, tech guru, uh, Hasnain Karim. He, he really, <laughs> when I'm stuck on, 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 on technology, any technological issue, he is there, always helps me out. Um, Hasnain, thank you so much. And you, man, you, you stick around with me, eh? I need you. Uh, all right. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks out of the way. Uh, Hasnain is my backbone on the technology side, so he controls everything that happens on the back. Um, so every, everyone should be muted, please. We don't need in, any interruptions or anything during our presentations. It's uh, inconvenient, it distracts the speaker. So please mute yourselves. Um, Dr. Hirji has requested questions at the end of her presentation, which will be about 40 minutes or so. She has a fantastic presentation. And even if you say that you know everything about uh, physio and looking up yourself physically and all that, you will, you will learn something new today. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to her presentation. Questions at the end. So please send your questions in through chat or raise hand on the Zoom platform. Um, and uh, Hasnain will give you a chance uh, to speak or ask your questions through chat. Uh, very important, this session is being recorded. If you do not want your image picture to appear in the recording, then may I please request that you switch your video off so then we don't have any other privacy issues later on. This is, for the first time, we are doing polls during the presentation, which means that there will be questions asked. Um, and with your device, uh, if you can respond, and it will help the speaker to know sort of you know, give her more information. Uh, so Dr. Hirji can tailor the presentation to the audience uh, which is uh, participating. Having said all that, oh my God, it's, I'm going on and on and on. So let's really get into it now. As we age, it's especially important to keep fit mentally, spiritually, and physically. And today, we will focus on the physical fitness. Our muscles may ache and our bones may creep, but we need to keep moving. 
and Dr. Selina will guide us and tell us as to what we should be doing. Dr. Selina Hirji is a resident of Toronto, is the owner and clinical director at Physio Plus, a multidisciplinary rehab clinic in Richmond Hill. Her practice provides chiropractic, physiotherapy, and massage therapy services. She is a dual licensed doctor of chiropractic and a registered physiotherapist with her master's master of physiotherapy degree from the University of Toronto and her doctor of chiropractic from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College. Dr. Hirji has extensive work experience in long-term care homes, working with work and sports related injuries, helping patients after receiving total joint replacements, providing acupuncture treatments and much, much more. Dr. Hirji has a special interest in chronic pain management is it, and she is a pain Truth Certified PTC Healthcare Provider. She is also the co-chair of Health and Wellness Board of our Toronto Jamath, and you may have seen her doing her COVID presentations. Dr. Hirji, the pleasure is all ours. We're looking forward to your presentation. All yours. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and thank you, Nazmal Uncle, for, um, for providing this platform. Um, I've known Nazmal Uncle for many years, and he's always been um, a proponent of, of uh, expanding your horizons and going beyond uh, what you've done before. He's always pushed me to do a little bit more, go a little bit out of my comfort zone, and for that, um, I do thank you for, for being uh, there and supporting me through that. I'm delighted to be here today. Of course, it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, having been in the world of physical health for a number of years, I'm excited to share with you um, a little snippet of, of what we do and what our world's about, but more importantly, um, how we can share some of that with all of us. We are in unusual circumstances to say the least, and I know all the activities that our seniors are involved in. And it gives me great pleasure to learn of all the activities that are available weekly, yoga, exercise classes. Uh, and of course, the as, as Nazmal Uncle had said, the physical and the mental. And so a forum like this uh, gives you an opportunity to combine many of those all together. So um, we are very fortunate to have that in our community. And I'm also extremely proud of our seniors and how well they have done through this pandemic. We have asked you guys from the very beginning to uh, stay home, be home. Uh, I know we've taken you away from your family, from your, from your outlets, social outlets. And through all that, um, we thank you for your efforts in, in staying where you are so that the, um, this pandemic can pass us inshallah as quickly as it came. And so we thank you all for your patience in all of that. I'm going to just take a moment now to share my screen. So just bear with me as I go into the presentation mode. Okay. Nazma Uncle, is that clear for everyone? No, we don't see it. Give me a second. January we normally month is especially in COVID, but today is a very special day because I got a call from the That's it. Okay, we're good? Yep. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So the topic that I that I give into this to this talk is uh, motion is lotion. And that may stir a few giggles, um, but uh, it's a very common term that we use in our world, in our world of movement. When we, when we talk about physical uh, rehabilitation or physical movement, uh, medicine, it is about movement. 
And um, for any of you who have had the chance to work with me or hear other talks that we've been involved in from the Health and Wellness Board, um, you'll understand that that is our theme. And so um, the, the subtitle that we're looking at is how to, how to move better, how to feel better, and how to be better during this pandemic. And so we know that um, in our previous generations, and I can speak to it having heard stories from my parents and my grandparents, um, we used to live a more physical, physically active lifestyle. We used to uh, walk to work, walk to school. And I know our youngsters don't like to hear it from us, um, but that's the truth of it. We were physically um, extremely more active than we were, than we are now. And so in this time where we're being asked to stay home, be home, uh, only mix with those in your, in your household, it does create challenges for us. But those challenges we think we can overcome and we know that those of us in this group have done, have done so and done very well. So what I'd like to start with is just by looking at the term physical activity. And I'm not here to, to give an exercise regime. As, as we've said before, you have all lots of sources of doing exercises online and with your yoga and et cetera. So what I'd like to talk about today is physical activity. And physical activity, as you can see here from these bumblebees buzzing around, um, is produced by any movement, any movement that's produced by skeletal muscles that require energy. So any movement, any movement, getting up and out of your chair, walking to and from your, your kitchen to your living room, all of that counts as, act, as physical activity. And as we continue to mature, um, these kinds of movements are important. They remain important, especially now, as we said, during the pandemic, we don't have access to our gyms. We don't have access to our our exercise classes in the mosque, all of these movements, these small movements, these transitional movements are important and they do add up at the end of the day. So they do count as far as energy and calories, but more important they count as far as, as movement of your joints. And what we say motion is lotion is that in your joints, when you're moving a joint, a joint is fed, it's food, if you will, is the fluid that, that surrounds the joints. And so by moving an arm or moving a leg or moving a hip, you are encouraging the loading of that joint, pressure on the joint, and thus moving around of those fluids in the joint. The fluids are what feed your joint in your cartilage, and that's what keeps your joint healthy. So it's, 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 an important, um, uh, it's important to remember that movement is critical to your joints. So when we talk about uh, physical activity, there are two components to physical activity. There is aerobic fitness, and there is strength and balance. And so we're going to look at both of these in depth very shortly. But before I started, oh, we wanted to start with a couple of questions. So before we continue, um, I'll pass it over to Nazmalako, who's going to, um, to start our poll. Actually, Hasnain will take care of it, Hasnain. Okay, so are we putting on the first question? Yep. First one, please. So the question here is, just to give us a feel for a gender breakdown, are you male or are you female? And there you go. So we are approximately, so will we get the by, answer right? Nasmul Bai, you tell me when to end the poll, please. I will. Okay, we got uh, about half of respondents. So keep going, We're still waiting for a few more. Okay, Paul ended. Excellent. So as we can see, it's 80% male, 20% female. So um, I don't know if that's representative of your normal participants. However, the one comment I will make as far as gender is concerned, even in the literature, when we look at the separation between males and females, there is a lag between the amount of physical activity that the females do. So um, I, I, we need to encourage our, our females to be, and especially in the younger ages, I think there's, there's still a gap, there's still a gender gap. And could we go to our second question, please? Okay, about, 
half of us have responded so far. Keep going, there are a few more coming in. Okay. Excellent, okay. So it looks like 45% are 61 to 70 years of age and 35% are 71 to 80 years of age and 16% are under 60. So uh, majority it looks like is the 61 to 70. So, um, so that's great. Um, and I'm glad that um, you are all seeking, you know, sources to increase your, your um, abilities to stay active. And, um, you know, there's lots to be done above the age of 60, but uh, you know, this is the group that we're looking at where we've told you, you are higher risk as far as uh, the transmission of COVID. And so um, this, this is an excellent forum that, that Nesmalinkle and his team have created for all of you to receive this information. So I applaud you for that. May we have our question number four, please? Is this the type of exercise? Uh, I think we skipped three. We wanted to do number four. I could. We, we can do that now. Okay. And here you can respond, you know, multiple choice. Okay. okay. Answer more than one, you know, different kinds of exercises, right? Perfect. Okay, there's still more results coming in. I'll close it in five. Four, three, two, one. Okay. Great. So, of all the choices we asked you, which exercises do you do? We gave you choices. 54% chose aerobics, or, or that they do aerobics. 61% are doing strength training. 18% are doing balance. And 32% are doing multimodal. That's great. Fantastic. And uh, I'm really impressed to hear about the multimodal. I'm not surprised to hear about the balance training. Some people, um, it, it isn't stressed at all in the literature and we're going to go straight into that. Um, but I'm also really glad to hear that uh, aerobics and strength training are, um, are being done by most. So let's proceed with the next slide if we may. So we'll close that, okay. All right, so um, we're gonna go straight into asking you um, some examples of physical activity. And that's what I was alluding to in my initial um, comments, introductory comments, is that um, we're not talking about organized exercise. So any type of cycling, walking, play, uh, even if it's playing with young children, gardening, house cleaning, all of those um, are physical activities. They do place demands on the heart and lungs. They do place demands on the muscles. And they do actually involve balance training, and, and we'll see that when we get to it. Um, so all of these things are acceptable forms of physical activity, all of which we can get lots of in our home. So how has pandemic changed you know, our, our ability to engage in physical activity? We know that um, activity levels are less. We, we aren't in and out of our houses. Our routines are disrupted. And I think in the early part of the pandemic, this was the hardest part. I think people were not sure how to alter, how to, how to communicate, how, how to go out for your essentials. And so our routines were disrupted. There's less volunteerism. And we have to say, I think there is a large component of the activities in our community, uh, which are supported um, by our senior group. And so a lot of you who are used to being at the mosque and who got a social outlet, but are, you're also helping, whether it's serving, whether it's moving chairs, whether it's uh, you know laying out um, um, you know things in in the in the in the, the room, it, it, all of that is is physical activity. So you are, are are not being able to do that at this point. We talk about less contact with our families, so driving to and from, um, visiting our families, and then the biggest one that I think was the hardest for many of us is just the lack of motivation, and we will address that near the end of our. Our presentation. And the final comment I'll make is the incidental physical activity. I always tell people when they come, they're coming for treatment to see me, is that the treatment to see me starts from the time they leave their home. And by that I mean 
um, the very act of getting into your, your car, the very act of, um, of you know, getting your coat on, putting your boots on, all of those uh, are physical activities. And so when we're doing less of that, then we have less a physical activity. So we are in a bit of a spot, but we have rallied. So when we talk about the benefits of physical activity, and this slide sort of gives you a comprehensive view. And if you look at, you know, um, hip fractures are decreased by 68%. Of course, that's, you know, near and dear to what I do. But you have to look at, you know, the mental component of it too. And we see that um, for those of us who are um, experiencing dementia, that, that it does decrease dementia up to 30%. For those who are different types of um, cancer, colon cancer and breast cancer in particular, research has shown that physical activity has benefit. Diabetes, of course, makes sense to us. Um, you know, using, using um, all forms of activity helps regulate your blood glucose. So there's many aspects um, that um, can be affected, can be helped by um, exercise. The one I want to bring our attention to is all-cause mortality. And um, it's shown that um, 6 to 10% of chronic diseases worldwide are attributable to lack of physical activity. So that's a, that's a fairly big number that can be cured by um, simple act, simple thing that we can take charge of ourselves. So, you know, it's 6% uh, of those with coronary artery disease, 7% of those with type two diabetes, 10% of those with breast cancer, colon cancer, um, are, are, are related, it's related to lack of activity. So there is something we can do, we can take charge. And then the softer issues, if you will, um, physical activity when, when done, you know, sufficiently improves our sleep, um, manages our stress, and we will talk about that later, and improves our quality of life. So there's many, many reasons for us to engage in physical activity. Let's dive into the one of two points that we talked about. Aerobic fit, fitness is, was number one on the list of the two. And this includes moderate to vigorous activity. In those who are um, of older than 60, what we research is finding is that moderate activity is actually more beneficial than more vigorous activity. And what is moderate activity? Um, for those of us who um, wanna keep track, how, what's, what's moderate for me is not moderate for my neighbor or my spouse. And so in our world, we have what's called a rated perceived exertion scale. Simply put, it's a scale of zero to 10 where zero is how you are feeling, how much energy exertion you, you feel you are demanding of yourself if you're sitting. And then 10 would be, say, if you were running for a great distance. And so moderate activity is for you to rate yourself as being either a five or a six. And it produces noticeable increase in breathing rate and heart rate. So if you are a cardiac patient, you, that is something different. And we would ask you to follow your cardiac um, rehab protocols where they'll give you a heart rate and a respiration rate to follow. So if you if you're, have specific conditions, you need to be more specific and speak to your therapist. For the rest of us who are managing our chronic illnesses or don't have chronic illnesses, these are the guidelines. We recommend, research recommends three days a week of having moderate aerobic activity. And each time we do that, we usually say about 150 minutes is sufficient. For those of us who are well-trained and have maintained a higher level, you can go up to 300. But the general recommendation is 150 minutes per week, which works out to about three, um, 50, 30 minutes per day of, of activity. So that's, um, that's it for a moderate, a moderate aerobic activity. Um, we're gonna move on to strength and balance. So we, as we saw from our poll, most people were doing strength, which is very good. It's the balance component that often gets um, forgotten. Most people don't realize um, you know, that balance is important. And I always tell my patients that when I'm teaching them how to, how to walk after a joint replacement or after an injury, um, I actually teach them to walk backwards. I actually teach them to get on an elliptical and to walk backwards. I get on a bicycle and to pedal backwards. And many of them kind of giggle and think, why am I making them, why on earth would I need to, to walk backwards? And the truth of the matter is, if you are walking and a sound, um, your, your sound is heard or someone calls your name um, or something is seen you know, to the back and to the side of you and you're, you're needing to turn your head and look that way, 
that shifts your balance. It shifts your weight onto your, your behind, the leg behind you or shifts your weight certainly out of your base of support. And you have to be able to use your footwork to recover so that you're not falling. And although we take that for granted when we're younger, as we begin to age, if we don't train our balance system, um, this is one of the systems where if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And our balance system in particular um, is composed of three things that's really important. The first being your eyesight, the second being your ears, or more specifically your inner ears, and the third being your feet. And so when I train people on, on a balance exercise, I will have them walk, and you could do this at home. You'll walk a, a certain distance in a safe environment, and then try this. Try and walk while nodding your head up and down, or try walk while nodding your head left and right. And you'll see that that um, you'll be amazed that all of a sudden that becomes a difficult task to do. And then try and walk with the TV on. So now you've got some noise on. And so all of these components, your feet will give you the information from the ground, feedback from the nerves of your feet. Your head, as you're turning to look left and right, your inner ear has balance centers. And so you need to uh, accommodate them. And finally, the third element of your eyesight. So as you're nodding your head up and down, if your eyesight is going up and down, you're also challenging the information from your eyes. So imagine that we're going for a walk and we're out on a sidewalk and uh, a fire engine um, comes by us and you turn your head to look forward. Unfortunately, the sidewalk underneath you has an uneven path. Your feet must be able to respond. Your eyes, because of the head turn to look at the fire engine must respond. And your ears will, will give you that information that you've turned your head and that you need to right yourself. So normally, I know and we're, when we're younger and we're running around um, and we're making mo faster movements, our balance system is being used. As we mature and we take a more sedentary life, we are seated more, we are, we are moving at a slower pace, um, we need to actually train our balance system. So that's what I'll say about balance. So I'm, I wasn't surprised to see that our poll that balance um, was not um, higher on the list. So um, all of these things are important when talking about um, balance, maintaining strength and balance. Um, of course, in, in terms of your physiological parameters, it does help you with your blood glucose. We talked about that for, for diabetes. It helps with your blood pressure. It helps as we talked about for physical function and mobility. So this gentleman is climbing stairs here in the picture. And we know that that can become a challenge as we mature, that going up and down stairs, for those of us who have to navigate stairs, that can become quite a challenge to us. And so it's important to keep up enough strength to be able to do that. We will talk about immune system if the question should arrive, but definitely there is a connection between physical activity and your immune system. And so, um, and then uh, in fact, as far as your lipid profile or your cholesterol more, more grossly, um, it does have an effect. So muscle strengthening is important for all of those uh, factors and balance I've talked about in depth. So for strength, muscle strengthening, um, when we look at, look at older adults, um, we look at what's called um, fancy, fancy word for aging, but essentially um, the research has shown that we can control um, for individuals who are adults, we can control symptoms and uh, chronic illnesses and conditions such as arthritis, diabetes, osteoporosis, heart disease, obesity, and back pain. So um, the, the fancy word is sarcopenia, and um, we can, but there are things we can do. So if I leave you with one positive message, it's that you are already doing this. I'm really happy to know all of the activities that are going on in our mosque and uh, our community and please keep it up because you can make a change. And so why is strength important? Um, of course, all those reasons, but the main, I would say, the main overlying functional reason I would say is to reduce falls. So falls, of course, is a multi-dimensional um, uh, issue to face, uh, strength being a very important component of it. As we begin to be more sedentary and we are seated more, um, so do we lose muscle strength. And then the ability to, as I say, come up too quickly, move out of your base of support, that's enough sometimes for a small fall. Um, when we do our fall risk assessment in, in, for individuals, we look at things like carpets, we look at lighting, we look at sounds, um, and all of those are risk factors. Medications, when are you taking your medications? All of those are risk factors for falls. 
but certainly strength is one of them. Um, most of the time um, as we age, we are going from sitting to standing, standing to walking. Um, and so those are the functional activities that we need to be sure that we have enough strength um, to be in, to, to prevent a fall. Um, and so that will help. Um, a study was done actually, or many studies were done. This was even pre, pre COVID, pre pandemic about um, doing exercise programs using telehealth or tele-exercise. And of course, the information that came back is that yes, it can be helpful um, uh, in terms of building muscle mass and then in turn by extension preventing falls. So you guys have already done that, you've done the jump and uh, I encourage you to continue doing that. Again, we return to balance and we did talk about balance. Um, again, we talked about fall prevention programs um, and uh, I gave you an example. The walking example, I think, is a good one to do. Sort of, certainly, if you're following with a therapist, you can be more specific for you. But I think the walking one is a really good one. Um, and if you add, like I said, lights, sounds, noise, if you walk with a smaller base of support. So if you're walking um, with your feet closer together, that becomes different, more difficult. If you walk with your heel to toe, heel to toe, that becomes. So all of these are things that can be done. Um, at home and can be considered balanced training. Simply standing with your feet close together and reaching forward with your hands. For those who are um, more advanced and we can still train you in balance, balance exercises in a seated posture. So balance is not only in standing, balance is important if you're seated in a chair. And why is that important? Because we are rising out of chairs. We are rising out of bed when we get up in the morning. So uh, balance is important for all of us. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll leave you with balance is it's important to train both in shoes and out of shoes. For the majority of the time we are in shoes, um, but many of us at home are not. And so if you want to really activate the nerves in the feet, the proprioceptors in the feet, um, there is merit to training barefoot. Going to move on now to what we're calling multi-component training. So we've talked about aerobic training, we've talked about muscle uh, muscle strengthening, and we've talked about balance training. Now, if you put all those three together, how? How do you put all those three together? Well, you guys are already doing it. As I said, you guys are way ahead of the game here. Um, and we have lots of groups that are holding uh, yoga classes for seniors. Um, and I do encourage uh, classes that are, are specific to the seniors. And you can see that Tai Chi is another option Tai Chi is an excellent, um, excellent, it's been, it's the, the highest as far as interventions for balance training. The research is showing that it is by far um, the one that provides the most uh, beneficial effects in, as specifically for strength training. Leave aside the strengthening, leave aside the social. Um, as far as balance training, Tai Chi ranks the highest on the list. Um, and so um, I encourage all of you to get involved with it. For those of you who've never tried either, um, chair yoga is an option. So I do encourage you to get involved with that. And what do, what do these two bring to the table? Everything, a little bit of aerobic, you know, the, the 15, 20 minutes that you're doing it, you've got your heart in your lungs, muscle strengthening, you're going to be holding postures. You don't need a weight, even holding your arm out extended is, an, is a form of muscle strengthening. It's also a realistic, strengthening. So it's something that you'll need functionally in the course of your day. And then balance training. So anytime you're on um, standing on one leg or partially on a leg, anytime you have a limb that's reaching forward and you're having to balance it, all of that um, is important to balance training as we've talked about in depth. So the recommendations um, that we have, um, we'll go through it at the end. Actually, I'll go through one more thing before I do that. But um, there are recommendations for um, older adults, and we will go through that. What I wanted to do now is to segue. Everybody's familiar with yoga. Everybody's familiar with Tai Chi, although you may not have tried it. If you can bear with me here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to segue into um, a, an exercise that I use here in, in the clinic. Um, and this is a star mat exercise. This is the star mat that we use in the clinic. Um, it looks very complicated. When you see the video, you'll know that it is possible to create this at home. You do not need to have a star mat. But if you'll bear with me, I will uh, minimize the slides and share with you my, um, 
my videos in a moment. Oops. Okay. Nuzwa Uncle, is this visible? Yes, it is. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So this exercise is called uh, half clock lunges. So if you'll see on the ground, um, it basically looks like a compass. And so you'll watch how the gentleman is going to be taking steps. So you'll continue all with one leg. Watch how he crosses behind. And then he'll come around to the other side. And you would, of course, repeat that with the second leg. So bear with me here one moment as I take this off. And I'm going to show you how this clock can then be extended for upper for your arms, upper limbs. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, sorry. Yes. We didn't we didn't see the whole clip. It's oh, I think way. I think I think that's all it was. I thought it was going oh, to go around the circle. Was. Okay. Yeah, that's all it was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just pause there so I can just talk to it. Um, so you do, again, you don't need to have this clock pasted on your wall. Um, you can simply, as he said, use post-it notes or simply imagine where they are. And so this, these movements, as you can see, are not straightforward. It's not straight up and down, not straight to the side. And the reason for that is that when you're reaching um, to do things at home, when you have laundry in your hands or you have um, a plate or a pot to be carrying, these are the functional directions that you'll be using at home. <laughs> And so this is where you want to just finish off. Um, that's it. Let me get back to the presentation. Okay, so we talked about the half clock lunges, which would be with your legs, of course, going one direction, and you would repeat going the other direction. Same thing with the single clock reaches, you will go one direction, and then you will repeat with the second. Usually what I ask people to do is to do three repetitions of each, and I ask them to do this daily. So if you imagine the clock lunges where the gentleman was stepping forward, so you can imagine, of course, you've got strength, of course, you've got balance, and of course, if you're going to do three repetitions, you're going to have your aerobic. So this is how it's be it became multimodal. So what are the guidelines um, for older adults? We talked about 150 minutes of moderate uh, intense aerobic activity at 30 minutes per day. We talked about uh, muscle strengthening, we've talked about, and what the recommendation is two days to include two days of strengthening at home. I mean, uh, of, of the muscle strengthening, and you can do this at home or, or wherever it may be. And then we talk about three or more days of the multi uh, component exercising that we just discussed. So if you like the star mat, that's fine. If you like yoga, that's fine. Um, as they've discussed here, it could be simply doing a bicep curl um, and doing a lunge with it. So as long as you've got some movement, some balance going along with some strengthening, then you don't need to follow a specific um, regime. The most important point, which comes as number four, is to limit sedentary time. Um, it's, nice to be, it's nice to be retired. Um, as I've learned from my dad, he gets up when he wants, he leaves when he wants and sets his own routine. And, and that's fantastic. Um, but what we need to make sure in all of that is that we have an appropriate balance of activity and rest. And so watching a one hour show of whatever that may be or a Zoom, a Zoom as you were doing just now, um, must then be um, followed by some form of activity. So we really like to ask you not to be seated more than the hour. I think the hour is even at, the, at, a, at a maximum limit and to balance that. So lots of time for enjoying everything you need, but keep your day balanced. So how do I stay on track? As we said in the beginning, um, you know, there's lots going on. Um, Helena, with us. Yeah. Do you want, before we go oh, there, do you sorry. want to do your weekly poll? Sure, I'll sure, please go it. ahead, please go ahead. So we're so asking this is, you. Mm -hmm. 
Good. This is the weekly amount of exercise per week during the week. Great. Okay, keep it coming. Yep, couple more. We are about halfway there. Yep, yep, one or two more. Okay, there we go. Excellent. So the highest number, <clears throat> we asked how much exercise do you do every week? 37% uh, of you said two to four hours per week. 17% said four to six hours per week. And 20% of you said over six hours. So I think Nazwa well, Uncle, we need a list of all those people so we can <laughs> congratulate them somehow. That's, I think that's more than me. So I think uh, you have some definite, uh, definite mentors in your group. Um, fantastic. Um, really, really fantastic. So uh, please keep it up. Like I said in the beginning, I've always been really um, impressed with um, the seniors and their level of activity. So fantastic. Okay, so we will continue um, with just some thoughts on, on how to stay on track. For those of you who are in that higher category, fantastic. Uh, from my experience, for those of you who um, are getting started on this or would like to do more, starting small. So uh, even five minutes a day walking, uh, it, it, as we know, we're building a habit, any, anytime we're building a new habit, it's just, it's the repetition. It's more the psychological component of it than it is the physical component of it. So learning to schedule yourself in, do something every day. And we've gone through this conversation. We haven't talked about exercise. We've talked about physical activity. So whatever it may be, if you're going to have a conversation, um, you know, with, with your, your child or your or, or, or relative, you can do that walking around your, your, your unit, your house. You, you can take that as, as an opportunity. Schedule it. So it is important to exercise the same time every day. Uh, it's, it's lovely to say, I'll, I'll do it in the evening and then you become tired. I'll do it after this and, and you become busy. So scheduling anything into your life um, keeps, you, keeps you on track with it. Finding an exercise that you enjoy, of course, whatever it may be is very important. When you don't like it, you won't do it. Connecting with nature is really important. Um, and I would say for those of you who would say, but there's ice and snow outside, where am I supposed to go right now? I would say to you, there are lots of, if you go on YouTube, um, there are lots of um, nature sounds, if you will, um, sounds of, of animals, sounds of rain, sounds of the ocean. If you play that, and, and scenery, you can have the scenery in the background too. If you play that, um, and you can, you can, you can still be, be doing your activities, whatever it may be, or you may just choose to have a quiet moment and have that in the background and have that um, as your virtual outside. Finally, accountability. So I have a lovely group of, of ladies that come to me. Um, and it started by one of them who had an injury and I came to see me. And she shared with me um, what her group does. There's eight of them retired teachers. Every day, come rain or shine, almost, uh, they are out there for a morning walk. And when COVID came, um, it, they continued that. When winter came, they continued that. And that is their lifeline. They, they, they come to me for treatment and they will tell me that basically that starts their day off in the right way. So if you have a friend now, if you're going to do it virtually, if you're going to check in, check mark. Um, in fact, there's a walking group of, of, of ladies my age who have a WhatsApp group. And how they've held themselves accountability is asking everyone to post a picture of a walk that they have taken that day. And there's a friendly competition and somebody's going to win, I think, a, a one hour massage at the end of the season. So however you can make it interesting and challenging, I think is the way to go. Final slide, 150 minutes of aerobic activity, two days a week of muscle strengthening, three days a week of multi-component. It sounds like a recipe, but nonetheless, and my favorite, avoid long periods without movement. In our world, we say if physical activity could be put in a capsule, it would undoubtedly be the most prescribed drug. So as I said in the beginning, motion is lotion. And that's it.
No, that's fantastic, uh, Dr. Hirji. Lots of information there. Um, we will now go to our Q&A. Uh, your timing is perfect, actually. Uh, you did very well. So for questions, raise your hand on the platform um, or uh, put it in the chat and uh, Asneen will give you a chance. <clears throat> okay, so there's one question that uh, actually a couple of questions. Uh, can you please explain more as to what happens when we walk backwards? Sure. Um, so when we talked about um, balance, we talked about the three components, your eyesight as being an element, your inner ear that has balance centers, and then your feet that are giving you the information for where your, your feet are placed and where you need to respond with your muscles of your legs and your hips. And we call them moments around the ankles. Once you're stepping, um, if you step on a surface, your ankles need to respond, the right muscles need to be activated, same with your knees, same with your hips. So what's happening when you're walking backwards, if you can imagine, you don't have the third, the component of the eyesight. So you're working basically on the use of your feet giving you feedback and your inner ear is giving you feedback of knowing that you are moving backwards. There are sensors in your ears that allow you to know whether you're going in which plane you're moving up and down to the side or tilting sideways. And so when you're walking backwards, those sensors need to be working your uh, feet need to be very acutely giving you information as to whether that was an unstable surface. If you're going from say a floor to a carpet, uh, you need to be able to react and angle your foot in a certain way so that you will land flat and, and then align your knees, your hips and, your, and your, your spine over the foot that's now at an angle. So they need to be mo moving uh, quickly we need to be moving in concert, one on top of another, in alignment with one another. And so what walking backwards does is take away your eyesight and makes you, um, and what this is all ca called in our world is proprioception. Do you have the proprioception, um, is your proprioception in tune with knowing where you are going in, in motion? And where are you in time and space? Does your body know through all these three mechanisms where you are headed? I hope that helps. Thank you. That was quite an elaborate uh, answer. <laughs> and uh, Murtaza is asking, and thank you, Murtaza, what is the truth pain management? Oh, okay. So this is actually um, quite, um, I'm actually quite passionate about this program. So I've actually had many years in working in chronic pain. Um, and chronic pain is an area that's very complicated. Um, the difference be between um, um, acute pain and chronic pain. So acute pain um, is something where you've had an injury and you've um, broken a bone, torn a muscle um, in some ways, and um, you are healing. Your body will take its time to heal. And what, um, what a chronic pain is, is when somebody has experienced pain for more than what we say, sometimes three months, sometimes six months. But in essence, that muscle or that bone that you have um, injured has long since healed. And so we know um, that the, the physical healing has taken place and yet an individual continues to experience pain. And this pain is very real. If we were to take, if we were to um, send you for what we call functional MRI and you were to do uh, movements while experiencing these pain, movements that were provocative for pain, and we were to see the MRI results during those movements, you would be experience showing signs of activity in those pain centers related to the, the activity that you were doing. My point is that um, it's chronic pain because of the fact that it's lasted more than three months. However, the treatment for someone who is experiencing chronic pain is significantly different than someone who is treating that who is experiencing acute pain. So in, a, in chronic pain, we're not treating the muscle or the bone that has been fractured or been torn. We are treating, actually, I'll tell you, your nervous system. Your, your central nervous system has two components. And so my work with individuals who are in the pain program is basically done remotely. I have done this and I'm currently doing it with someone who doesn't even live in the country. And so we walk you through the stages to begin to um, increase your function, decrease your pain, 
uh, through various strategies, which are difficult to explain now. But the point is, um, what we're treating is your nervous system and the hypersensitivity of your nervous system versus the physical insult that may or may not have happened in the past. So long answer to a short answer question, uh, but it, it, at the crux of it is uh, it's a chronic pain program. I hope Murtaza, that was a good answer. Uh, so there's another question here. What is the best time to schedule exercise? Um, I think that's a really good question. So um, as, as we said in the beginning, um, to choose the same time every day, and, and that leads to scheduling so that you will complete it. It'll be one of your tasks for the day. But it also takes into effect for those of us who have comorbidities, those of us who have other chronic conditions, whether it be diabetes, whether it be heart related, whether it be kidney related, um, you, many of us are on medications for that. Many of us have peak times in the day where we have more energy and other times where we have less energy. And so you want to be doing your physical activity first and foremost throughout the day. So what I usually like to um, ask, first of all, from a global perspective, when is the time where you have most energy in the day? And that could be, as I said, related to your condition, related to medication, related to childcare issues. So when is the best time where you have a quiet, consistent time to do it in the day? So that's one thing. So if you were to do say uh, 10 minutes of, of a bicycle activity. However, the, the other answer is that I'm actually a huge proponent of not setting aside a particular time, like a, a specific time, but rather to intersperse these activities throughout your day. So for instance, if you're putting away, um, if you're putting away dishes from the, from the dishwasher, that in and of itself is an activity. So as you go to put those dishes away, stop and put that, that item, whatever it may be, put it back in the closet, three repetitions, put it down to the floor in your cupboard, three repetitions. By the time your dishwasher is empty, you've had some exercise, you've had some activity. And that has required core because you're standing, it has required length, lengthening your arms to reach out, it has required balance because you're turning to put your the cup or the dish to whatever direction it is. So I'm a very big proponent on interspersing this throughout the day. So by the end of the day, you have done a certain amount of activity. And, and um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So you're really saying that we should all be doing more housework, right? Exactly, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there's, so there's one more question here. Those who wear progressive or bifocal uh, glasses, and sometimes when uh, we're taking uh, stairs, we miss a step due to an issue with vision. So how does that uh, play in with the exercise? And what are your recommendations and advice? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think that's an excellent question. Um, and it lends itself back to my, my, my most favorite spot of being balanced. And so when, you, when I have individuals who have to navigate stairs, um, that becomes a focal point because it is a place uh, where there's a risk for falls. The eyesight is, a, is also a factor as, as the question has proposed. What I suggest then, sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, so what I suggest is that you create a time where you're standing at the bottom of the stairs. Your depth of the step will be different from someone else and somewhere else in someplace else in your in your house. You need to learn what is where is the space? How far is the space to the next step? You need to know that from information from your feet and information from your body awareness. So this is where the proprioception comes in. You need to know what's specific to those stairs. So you need to practice that. So you need to go to the bottom of the stairs, hold the railing and practice going up, up and down, up and down and come to know your surroundings. And that's why these, when I say you're passing the stairs, that's why I say that becomes your exercise. So rather than putting aside time, I would say every time you pass those stairs, go up, go up and down a few steps up and a few steps down. And that's how you're going to be aware. Um, eyesight is important, but more important from my perspective, um, because I'm not an eye care pr 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 practitioner, when, from my perspective, it's your physical proprioception, your body awareness of where you are in any space and time. This could happen, as far as bifocals, it could happen, uh, vision is concerned, getting up out of a chair. If you're not familiar, you could be rising with your body too far forward, and then you lose your balance. 
Thank you for that. There is another question from uh, Brother Shokat. For anyone who is uh, currently undergoing pain management and wants your clinic's uh, assessment, what is the best way to do this? Um, sure. Um, I don't know, Nesma Uncle, how we could pass my contact, but I'm certainly available whichever way uh, Nesma Uncle would like to pass that on. Um, and we could connect by, by phone or email. Uh, this is uh, Shokat. Which Shokat is this? Shokat. It's Shokat Karmali. Okay, so Karmali. I'll, be, I'll be in touch with you. I'll send it to you directly, okay? Thank you. I made a note of that. Okay, it's uh, right on about 3.59. One minute to go. Aston, any more questions? No more questions. Please go ahead. No more small. questions except one from me, very quickly. <laughs> you touched on, uh, Dr. Hirji, you touched on immune system and it's, you know, the connection with physical exercises or something like, can you expand on that, please, if you can? Sure, I can. Um, we, um, we've looked into the literature, obviously, I think the, the, the focus for everyone right now, of course, is, you know, the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. And for those of us who are in physical rehab, um, you know, we're well aware of the connection between um, physical activity and uh, respiratory conditions. Um, and it's, uh, SARS, SARS-2 being, being, of course, a respiratory um, illness. And so what we know from the literature is that moderate levels of exercise are better than vigorous levels of exercise for immune fun function, which is great because for this, for your age group, for your population, we know that um, we're also recommending based on your age group that moderate activity. So this is perfect for that. Um, for those who um, are interested in um, physical activity and its effect on uh, the respiratory system and the immune system. They're, they're kind of you know, connected. We know that um, exercise increases, changes the antibodies and the white blood cells. And we know that blood, white blood cells um, are part of our immune system and that's what helps fight, uh, fight disease, fight the, the virus. And so the antibodies or white blood cells circulate more rapidly when you are involved with moderate activity. And um, we also know that um, there's a rise in, uh, in temperature and body temperature when you're doing physical activity, which also helps with um, fighting the infection. We also know that physical activity increases the release of stress hormones, and um, which, uh, which helps in the fight of illness as well. So lower hormones may pr protect against illness, the, the, uh, illnesses. So there are a number of ways and just the physical mechanical movement also helps to flush out bacteria in the lungs and the airways, and that reduces your chance for um, uh, getting a cold or flu or respiratory type illness. So it's really uh, the focus I would say would be moderate type um, activities, uh, physical activity, and that's was sort of why, we, why I catered this talk towards that. So all of you can continue to do all the great things that you're doing right now and know that something very simple as physical activity is going to give you an added benefit um, in addition to all the public health measures that we're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's okay. excellent. All right. I think uh, we will stop here for two minutes past four. Two announcements. Number one is uh, this session was recorded. It will go on our website, which I should have announced earlier on. It's barazatoronto.com. Baraza, B-A-R-A-Z-A. B -A toronto.com and you'll see all of our previous recordings uh, you'll find the other bit of news is good news story we have lined up speakers almost every week every sunday from now through to early april so and we are working on you know getting more and more speakers different subjects uh, experts uh, in those uh, you know different areas that will be of interest to us, so look out for the announcement, the notice that goes out uh, about a week before the a week earlier before the session. And uh, with that, I will end. Thank you all for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again uh, next uh, Sunday, same time, same place.